Well, tonight we're going to pick up where we left off two weeks ago. And the reason I say two weeks ago is because I didn't teach last week. Lisa did. Every Thanksgiving she prepares for the Wednesday night service while I'm preparing for the Sunday morning service. So I can take off Thursday and Friday also. You see, if I didn't have her teach that Wednesday night, that, that means that I'd have to come back to work either Friday and Saturday or I'd have to work on Thanksgiving Day, and I don't like to do that. So she was gracious enough to do that. So two weeks ago, we got as far as Genesis chapter 9, verse number 4. So tonight, we're going to begin in verse number 5. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 9. Let's read verses 5 and 6. It says, And I re will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die. And anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image. Now remember that blood represents life. You know, sometimes I think we forget that because when we see blood, we just think of death. Is that not true? But remember, it doesn't represent death unless it's pouring out. And I think that's probably the only time that we see it, when blood is pouring out. And that's why we think death. But Leviticus, the 17th chapter, verse number 11, tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood. So blood represents life. So notice what the first sentence in verse number 5 is actually saying. And I will require the blood. In other words, the life of anyone who takes another person's life. And the rest of verse 5 and verse 6 expounds upon that. If you take another person's life, then God requires that your life be taken. Now, I want you to underline the word require. It's translated from the Hebrew word darash. Darash is a judicial term. It literally means to demand. So I want you to get the picture that this verse is painting. God is the ultimate judge of mankind, and if anyone takes another man's life... God demands that his life be taken. In other words, God demands that he be put to death. That is the penalty for killing another human being. And God demands that the sentence be carried out. Now, this is one of the Noahide laws. So is it still in effect today? Yes, you betcha. So if you're a Christian, you should believe in capital punishment. No ifs, ands, or buts. So if you're a liberal and you're sitting here tonight and you don't believe in capital punishment, that means that you disagree with the Word of God. You must understand that God is the one who demands that if a person takes another person's life, their life is to be taken. Now I want you to notice the first part of verse number six. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. So who's supposed to enforce this law? God or man? Man is. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. God set the penalty, but we're supposed to enforce it. You see, the preposition by is a beth of instrumentation. If you studied Hebrew, you know that Beth is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. You understand that the vowels and how that works in there. But I want you to know that in Hebrew grammar, this is the Beth of instrumentation, which means that man is to be the instrument that God uses to enforce this law. So God is the one who dictated the penalty for taking a person's life, but we're the one that's supposed to carry it out. So what God is doing is he is giving man the authority to establish laws governing society based upon his laws and principles. That's why Paul wrote what he did in Romans the 13th chapter. He wrote that government authority comes from God. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Romans, the 13th chapter. I want to read the first five verses. Notice very carefully what Paul has to say about government. He says, everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in, pa in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Then do what is right, and they will honor you. The authorities are God's servants, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, 
Of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Now, Paul is saying that the authority of government comes from God. So what's he basing that on? Paul's saying this. Is this just revelation that he received? And of course we know that he received revelation from Jesus Christ directly when he was in the wilderness. We also know that he received revelation from God. Is this one of those revelations that he received directly from God and there's no Old Testament biblical basis for this? No. So what is he basing this on? He's basing this on Genesis chapter 9 verses 5 through 6. In those two verses... God gave man the authority to establish laws governing society. But the laws man establishes are to be based upon God's laws and principles. Now, this is New Testament, people. So as I said, the Noahic covenant is still in effect today, as well as the Noahide laws. Now, this divine law, demanding that a person's life be taken for taking another person's life, only applies to murder. It doesn't apply to self-defense. It doesn't apply to accidents. It doesn't apply to war. It only applies to murder. So if someone breaks into my house and I shoot them and they happen to die, this Noahide law doesn't apply. It only applies to murder. And let me prove that to you. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Exodus, the 22nd chapter, verse number 2. It says, If a thief is caught in the act of breaking into a house and is struck and killed in the process, the person who killed the thief is not guilty of murder. So the Oklahoma law, the make your day or make my day law, do you remember that law? If someone breaks into your house and you shoot them, they cannot sue you. You can't get in trouble for that. That is based upon the Bible and thank God we passed it. Before we did that, you know, someone broke into your home while you were there, you shot them and killed you, you might be sued for that. You might have to go to prison for that. And Oklahoma finally woke up and said, you know what, we need to put a law down that if someone breaks into your house and you shoot them and they die, then you can't be sued for that. You can't be prosecuted for that because they came into your house. Well, thank the Lord that we had enough sense to go back to the Word of God, see that it's actually in there and that you have a right to do that. So this law in Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, doesn't apply to self-defense. If a person is killed by accident, it's not considered murder, and that person's life is not to be taken. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 35. Let's read verses 22 through 25. But suppose someone pushes another person without having shown previous hostility, or they throw something that unintentionally hits another person, or accidentally drops a huge stone on someone, though they were not enemies. And the person dies. If this should happen, the community must follow these regulations in making a judgment between the slayer and the avenger, the victim's nearest relative. The community must protect the slayer from the avenger and must escort the slayer back to live in the city of refuge to which he fled. There he must remain until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the sacred oil. So, who is the slayer? Who's the slayer? What's the person who killed someone by accident? Who is the avenger? It's the family of the person killed. We know that if someone in our family dies as the result of someone negligence or maybe something that they did and shouldn't have done, even though it's an accident, what do we want? We want to punish them. We want to be the avenger. And God understands that sometimes accidents happen and someone dies. And so one of the things that he says, and I want you to notice what he says in verse 25. He says the community must protect the slayer from the avenger. Now does every under, and everyone understand what that's saying? It's saying that if someone kills someone and it's an accident, even though someone might come in and want to retaliate, want to get vengeance, the Bible says the community needs to protect the slayer because he didn't mean to do it. So I want you to understand where God says, I demand that if a person takes another person's life, that his life be taken. He also comes back and says, I'm not talking about accidents. I'm only talking about murder. But let's go a little bit further. Last but not least, killing someone in a time of war is not considered murder. Turn with me to Deuteronomy, the 20th chapter, verses 10 through 13. 
It says, as you approach a town to attack it, you must first offer its people terms for peace. If they accept your terms and open the gates to you, then all the people inside will serve you in forced labor. But if they refuse to make peace and prepare to fight, you must attack the town. When the Lord your God hands the town over to you, use your swords to kill every man in the town. Now, of course, if you understand a little bit about the culture at the time, and the reason why God told them that when they went into Canaan that they were supposed to do this, then this makes a lot more sense. But the thing that I want you to see that in times of war, it's not considered to be murder. So this requirement that God came in and, and mandated in Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 through 6, that if a person takes another person's life, their life is to be taken, does not apply to times of war. So it doesn't apply to accidents. It doesn't apply to self-defense. It doesn't apply to times of war. Now, let's go a little bit deeper. Do you mind doing that? Because I, I think so many of us today have lost all common sense. See, America is going in a way that it shouldn't be going. We truly have lost all common sense. But the reason we have is because we, it's because we forget that the foundation of our judicial system is based upon God's word. We don't understand that if we want to have a great country, it must be based upon God's word. And so we go all the way back to the beginning. We don't go to the New Testament. We go all the way back to Genesis. And Genesis means the beginning. And we see that God laid the foundation. And when he gave authority to man to establish laws in order to govern society, but those laws are supposed to be based upon God's laws and principles, we need to understand that if we want our nation to remain great, we must abide by God's laws and principles. Am I making sense? So let's go a little bit deeper. Every once in a while, you'll hear an opponent of the death penalty use the Sixth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill, as an argument against capital punishment. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter, verse number 13. It says, Thou shalt not kill. Now, if you've ever felt guilty for not memorizing Bible verses, you need to realize that there are certain Bible verses that are very easy to memorize. This is one of them. Memorize the sixth commandment in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Memorize Jesus wept. See, those are the type of verses you want to memorize. Now, this is a very simple one. God's listing what he considers or what we consider to be the Ten Commandments. The first five deal with man's relationship with God. The last five deal with man's relationship with man. The very first one, and it's kind of sad, that the very first commandment that deals with man's relationship with man has to be murder. Thou shalt not kill. Now, this is the sixth commandment of the tenth commandment. And it seems like every time the state is executing someone, you've got this group of protesters and at least one or two of them's holding up a sign with the sixth commandment on it. You ever seen that? We're executing someone and so channel six, channel two, channel eight goes down there. They're filming this. You've got this group of protesters. And many times there's nuns there with the protesters. And there's Catholic priests there with the protesters. And they're holding up a sign. Thou shalt not kill. And if they interview that group, this is the argument they make. God commanded us not to kill. So even if this person killed someone, we shouldn't kill them. Because God said, the sixth commandment and the tenth commandment, thou shalt not kill. So if we execute this man, it makes us just as guilty as he is. Well, people, that's an invalid argument. And let me explain why I say that. First of all, God never said, thou shalt not kill. Let me repeat that. God never, ever said, thou shalt not kill. God said, thou shalt not murder. We just haven't translated the verse right. You see, the word kill in Exodus 20, 13 is translated from the Hebrew word. And this is very hard for me to say. You need to understand, they don't do the H sounds. They do more like a K sound. And then the T and S together is really tough. So this word is translated from the Hebrew word, ratzak. Best I can do without spitting on everyone down here, all right? And it means to murder. So God never said, thou shalt not kill. God said, thou shalt not murder. In fact, I want you to notice how the other versions translate this verse. The New American Standard translates it, you shall not murder. The NIV translates it, you shall not murder. 
The New King James Version translates it, you shall not murder. The NLT, which is really an interpretation, I don't know why they call it a translation. I like to read it from time to time, but I want you to understand it is not a translation, it's an interpretation, and there is a difference. But the NLT translates this, you must not murder. So, using the Sixth Commandment as an argument against capital punishment doesn't hold water. It's not true at all. In fact, the Sixth Commandment actually supports the death penalty. It actually supports capital punishment. And let me explain why I say that. In the Sixth Commandment, God specifically states, Thou shalt not murder. Well, what if someone breaks that commandment? What are we supposed to do? What's the penalty for breaking the Sixth Commandment? Is there a penalty? What good is there to have a law if there's no penalty for breaking that law? What if we just decided we were not going to enforce any of the laws in Telequah? Let me tell you, and I'm a minister, the speed zones, the speed limits would mean nothing. You would see total anarchy. The only way that we can get people to keep the laws is to do what? To enforce them and to have a penalty for breaking the law. Now, I want you to understand that there has to be a penalty for these laws, and God understands that. So what's the penalty for breaking the Sixth Commandment? Well, according to God, in Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 through 6, if anyone takes another person's life, in other words, he murders them, their life is to be taken. And that's confirmed in the Mosaic Law. So God lays this down in the Noahic Covenant, but we find a, a little bit later that when God comes along and delivers the children of Israel out of Egypt and he establishes this covenant with this nation, he's going to set up all of these laws. And what's great is when America began, we set up our legal system, we set up our judicial system based upon the laws of this Mosaic covenant. And we've seen ourselves as we get further and further away literally become a nation without common sense. But it's because we're getting away from that. But I want you to understand, when God established this relationship with the nation of Israel, he, he establishes what is known as the Mosaic Covenant. Now, I want you to understand that this death penalty is confirmed in the Mosaic Covenant. Turn with me to the book of Numbers, the 35th chapter, verses 16 through 18. But if someone strikes and kills another person with a piece of iron, it is murder. And the murderer must be executed. Or if someone with a stone in his hand strikes and kills another person, it is murder. And the murderer must be put to death. Or if someone strikes and kills another person with a wooden object, it is murder. And the murderer must be put to death. Do you need me to expound on any of that? It's pretty simple, isn't it? Now look at Numbers chapter 35, verses 30 through 31. All murderers must be put to death. Did you see the first word there? What is it? All murderers must be put to death. Why? Because the word required in Genesis chapter 9 actually is a judicial term and it means God demands. If you take another person's life, if you murder them, God demands that your life be taken. It's required. So now we go a little bit further. We're not only in the Noahic covenant, we're in the Mo Mo Mosaic covenant the covenant that God established with Israel, and it says all murderers must be put to death, but only if evidence is presented by more than one witness. No one may be put to death on the testimony of only one witness. Also, you must never accept a ransom payment for the life of someone judged guilty of murder and subject to execution. In other words, let's say someone is a murderer, but they're rich. And they go, you know what? I killed this person. I murdered them. I didn't mean, you know, well... If it's an accident, it wouldn't matter. But he, I, I meant to do it, but you know, I, I don't want to die, so they have all this money. Can you accept money in change for that? Well, notice what it says. Murderers must always be put to death. You can't do that. So capital punishment is the penalty for breaking the Sixth Commandment. So the Sixth Commandment actually supports the death penalty. Now let's go even deeper. Can we go deeper? Let's go deeper. One of the seven Noahide laws is to establish just laws in order to govern society. Do you guys remember what the Noahide, uh, the Noahide laws are? I gave the seven. You want me to go through them real quick? 
The first is prohibition of idolatry. The second is prohibition of murder. The third is prohibition of stealing. The fourth is prohibition of sexual immorality. The fifth is prohibition of blasphemy. The sixth is the prohibition of eating blood or any meat that's not been drained of its blood. And we kind of went in depth on that. And the last one is the requirement to establish just laws to govern society. Now, the seventh Noahide law is to establish just laws in order to govern society. And this law is based on Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, and more specifically on verse number 6. Look at verse 6 again. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will, will also be taken by human hands. Underline the word by, as I've already stated. The preposition by is a beth of instrumentation, which means that man is to be the instrument that God uses to enforce this law. So God set the penalty, but man is supposed to enforce it. So in essence, what this is saying is that God gave man the authority to establish laws in order to govern society, but... The laws we establish are to be based upon his laws and upon his principles. And that's why the Jews believe that one of the seven Noahide laws is the requirement to establish just laws to govern society. Is everyone with me? Does everyone follow that train of thought? All right. This is where they get that. And so God established this right after the flood. So let me ask you a question. Since we're talking about establishing laws to govern society. Is it possible to legislate morality? Because I constantly hear people make this statement. You can't legislate morality. How many of you ever heard someone make that comment? Now do not raise your hand to this question. Sit on your hands. How many of you have ever made that comment? Wow. Wow. Well, what do they mean by that? When they say you cannot legislate morality, what do they mean by that? Well, let's break it down. The word legislate means to create or pass laws. And what is morality? Well, morality is defined as a system of ideas of right and wrong conduct. That's what morality is. If we want to know if we're a, a, a moral country or not, we want this system of, of what we consider to be right and wrong conduct. We have this little system here, and we go, well, you know, people don't live by what's right and wrong. They do more of what's wrong, so we're not a moral country anymore. So that's what morality is. It's a system of ideas of right and wrong conduct. So when you say you can't legislate morality, you're saying you cannot create a system of what society considers to be right and wrong by passing laws. Did you hear what I said? Did you catch what I said? Let me say it again. When you say you cannot legislate morality, you're saying that you cannot create a system of what society considers to be right and wrong by passing laws. Now, to be honest with you, that's a bunch of hogwash. We do it all the time. We consider it wrong to be drunk in public public intoxication. So we have passed laws against being drunk in public. And if you're caught, you're going to be arrested. And depending upon who you know, your record's either going to be expunged or you're going to have to pay a fine. Right? No. Okay. We consider it wrong to smoke marijuana. Right? So we pass laws against possessing marijuana. And if you're caught with marijuana, you're going to be arrested and you're going to be punished. We consider it wrong to steal. Is there anyone here that thinks it's right to steal? Okay. We consider it wrong to steal. We consider it wrong to view child pornography. You get caught with it, you're going to jail. And when you get out of jail, you're going to have to register as a sex offender. Yeah. Pastor, do you think that's right? You betcha. You betcha. We consider it wrong to sell your body for sex, which is prostitution, unless you live in Las Vegas or certain places. And we consider it wrong to solicit a prostitute. So we've got laws against that. And I could go on and on, but my point is this. 
Legislating morality is why we create laws in the first place. We want to define what our society considers to be right and wrong behavior. So to say that you can't legislate morality is moronic. Yeah. Now, if you want to say that you can't force people to be moral, that's another thing. I would agree with you. We can't force you to be moral. But don't say you can't legislate morality because that's the main purpose of passing laws. We've created a system of what society considers to be right and wrong conduct. And we pass laws to enforce that conduct. You can't punch someone in the face. If I decide that I'm going to punch Terry in the face, I say, Terry, stand up. And I just fall off and hit him. And every one of you saw, someone's going to call Chris the police officer here. And by the way, do you know why we have a police officer here? Because we live in an immoral nation. We have a police officer at, police officer at a church. But if I smack Terry in the face, someone's going to ask Chris to come in here. And then he's going to line everyone up, and you guys are going to say, I saw Pastor Allen do it. I'm going to be charged with assault. Now, people, if you charge me with assault, you're legislating morality. You're telling me that that's wrong conduct. You can't legislate morality. People, that's stupidity. Now, we can't force you to be moral, but our society can arrest you for being immoral. Did you catch what I said? We can't force you to be moral, but our society can arrest you for being immoral. We do that when we come in and we arrest people who are selling dope or when they're, they're soliciting prostitutes or they're viewing child pornography or any of those type of things. We have come along and we have set up a system of what we consider to be right and wrong and we have passed laws in order to enforce that conduct. Does that make sense? People, that's the whole purpose of making laws. I bet none of you ever thought of that. Anyways, I shouldn't go in there. Sorry, I, I get off on this when I see America going down the path it is, and I, I hear people spew that out all the time. You can't legislate morality. And I'm thinking, have you really even thought about what you're saying? Anyways, let's move on to verses 8 through 11 because we beat that dead horse. <laughs> then God told Noah and his sons, I hereby confirm my covenant with you and your descendants and with all the animals that were on the boat with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, every living creature on earth. Yes, I am confirming my covenant with you. Never again will floodwaters kill all living creatures creatures never again will a flood destroy the earth now I want you to notice that I highlighted and I underlined the words never and all did it come up on the screen were you watching that did you see that the reason I did that was so that I could explain how forcefully this is stated in the original language you see when the word all is preceded by the Hebrew negative lo it signifies absolute negation and, of course, the word never is translated from the Hebrew word lo. In fact, if, if you go to Israel, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to say, Ata, Ata, Amerikai. And you're either going to say yes, kin, or you're going to say no, lo. If you're not an American, you say lo. I'm not an American. And then you might go further. I need a vein kitsat ivrit, which means I understand a little Hebrew. Not much, but a little. Now, the word low is the negative. And what this is telling us is whenever the word all is preceded by the Hebrew negative low, it signifies absolute negation. So what this is saying is that God will never, ever kill all living creatures or destroy the entire earth with a flood ever again. You can take that to the bank. God is guaranteeing it. It's like he's saying, never, ever, never, ever, ever do it. And this promise to never, ever do that again is part of God's covenant obligations. Now remember, the Noahic covenant is a unilateral covenant. Do you remember what a unilateral covenant is? It's a covenant where only one of the two parties 
has covenant obligations. And in this case, the only one who has covenant obligations is God. Only God has covenant obligation in the, in the Noahic covenant. So what that means is that God is obligated to keep this promise irregardless of what man does or doesn't do. God tells us not to eat blood or to eat animals that haven't been drained of blood. But if you do that, God's not going to flood the world again and kill every living creature. If we become as immoral as we can be, God has already promised that he's never, ever again going to, going to destroy the entire earth and every living creature again. He's not going to do it. And it doesn't matter how evil we become. Why? Because God has promised to never, ever do that. And this is a unilateral covenant. God's going to fulfill his obligation irregardless of, wh of what we do or we don't do. Now let's move on to verses 12 and 13. Then God said... I am giving you a sign of my covenant with you and with all living creatures for all generations to come. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. Now, I want you to underline the word rainbow. Rainbow is translated from the Hebrew word kisheth, and it's normally used as a weapon, a bow, as in a bow and arrow. That's why the King James Version and the New American Standard translate this as bow rather than rainbow. Because technically, he promised to put his bow, not rainbow, in the sky. We just come a little bit further and go, oh, that's what God means. And it's true. But if you want to get technical, it's the word bow, which is a weapon, as, a, as in a bow and arrow. Now, here's what's interesting. In ancient times, whenever a warrior carried a bow up... It was a sign of war because the warrior wanted to be able to string an arrow very quickly. and He wanted to be able to bring it into position very quickly because you're in a time of war. There's hostility. Now, does everyone know what I mean by whenever a warrior carried the bow up? A bow goes like this. That's why we call it something. If you take a piece of wood and you bow it, you're going to bow it. It means you're going to curve it. So when we say a bow is up, what we mean is it's curving up. So whenever a warrior carried his bow up, it curved up, not towards the ground, but up towards the sky. It was a symbol of hostility in war. And the reason it was is because whenever you were in wartime, the warriors would carry their bows up. So when they saw it, they didn't have to flip it around. They literally could just bring it up, take the arrow, string it very quickly, and they were in a position to fire. On the other hand, when a warrior carried a bow down, it was a sign of peace. He could relax. It's comfortable. It's more natural to allow the curve of the bow to go down. So in Noah's day, the shape of the rainbow was very important. When they saw the ends of the rainbow touching the earth, in their mind, it signified the end of hostility. God wasn't judging the world anymore. He wasn't bringing his judgment and killing everyone. It was the beginning of peace. Why? Because the bow was down. It's not in a position of hostility. So it was a sign of peace between God and man. Now, we know that the rainbow is a natural phenomenon, right? You know, we read this, and here's what's kind of interesting. We read this along, and we go, ooh, that's so neat. God put this rainbow in the sky. And then we grow up a little bit. We take a science class, and we find out... Well, that's a natural phenomenon. A rainbow is the result of the refractive dispersion of sunlight in drops of rain or mist. You could have taken that test and passed that, right? You knew what a rainbow was. You knew it was a refractive dispersion of sunlight. If you didn't know that, you knew it was something like that. But you need to remember that before the flood, it had never rained. There had never been rain clouds over the land. There was never any rainbows. Therefore, from its inception, from the very first time it appeared, the rainbow was a symbol of God's covenant. But my point is this. Even though it's a natural phenomenon, it's the result of a supernatural event because there were never any rainbows ever before this time because the earth was covered, its atmosphere, with a water canopy. This vapor of water was around it, and there was no rain on the land. The book of Genesis tells us that it didn't rain. In fact, that's why they laughed at Noah. 
He said God's going to send a flood. And how in the world? The way it's watered is this dew comes up from the ground and we have all of this. What are you talking about? We've got this Garden of Eden everywhere. And then all of a sudden this water canopy breaks up and that's the rain and that's how it's able to cover the entire earth. But all of a sudden because of that, we have this climate change. And now with the evaporation over the sea, we're going to have winds. It's going to take the rain clouds over and it's going to rain. And so the very first time he comes out and what does Noah see? He sees this rainbow. Well, yes, it's a natural phenomenon. We know that. But we also need to understand it's the result of a supernatural event. Because without the flood ever occurring, without this supernatural event, there would never be a rainbow. So the rainbow is the perfect sign of the Noahic covenant, which takes us to verses 14 and through 17. Let's read those three verses, 14, 15, 16, those four verses. When I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds. And I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the flood waters destroy all life. When I see the rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. Then God said to Noah, yes, this rainbow is the sign of the covenant I am confirming with all the creatures on earth. And that concludes, finally, the story of the flood.